This growth factor is just as anabolic or even more anabolic than testosterone. Your body makes it naturally, it causes muscle growth, improves recovery and improves your fat metabolism. And some athletes even inject this stuff because it helps build muscle and recover faster. This growth factor is called IGF-1. Stay tuned to the end and I'm gonna explain how IGF-1 works and how you can optimize it naturally. Remember this video is for informational purposes only and it's not medical advice. Always consult a healthcare professional before making changes to your health regimen. All right, let's get into it. Insulin like growth Growth factor 1 or IGF-1 is a growth factor that's mostly made by your liver in response to growth hormone. You should definitely watch my recent video on growth hormone but basically growth hormone is released from the brain in response to things like intense exercise, sleep, hunger and low blood sugar. Growth hormone travels through the blood and it binds to receptors in the liver cells and some signaling happens within those cells and the result is the production of IGF-1 from the liver. IGF-1 binds to some binding proteins to stabilize it and basically make it stick around longer in the blood rather than getting cleared away immediately. IGF-1 can be made outside of the liver too. It's made directly in the muscles in response to mechanical stress like lifting weights which is obviously very useful for muscle growth and repair. In the muscles this version of IGF-1 is called mechano growth factor. It's not exactly the same, it's technically called a splice variant of IGF-1 but it has similar effects. An important thing to note, since IGF-1 or mechano growth factor can be made locally in tissues like muscle, this means that your blood IGF IGF-1 levels don't tell the full story because you could have low IGF-1 in your blood but high tissue IGF-1 which is actually doing its thing pretty well in the muscles. IGF-1 is also regulated by thyroid hormones, nutrition status which we'll get into a bit later. Once IGF-1 has been made it circulates in the blood or it acts directly in the local tissues like muscle. So let's talk about what IGF-1 can actually do. It binds to receptors in muscle cells and this binding activates the mTOR signaling pathway which is one of the main anabolic signaling pathways in the human body. And this increases muscle protein synthesis and it reduces muscle protein breakdown. IGF-1 also seems to inhibit myostatin and myostatin is a protein that limits muscle growth. You might have seen that people or animals with a myostatin deficiency have much more muscle mass than is normally possible. So for example, the Belgian blue breed of cows. So by inhibiting myostatin, IGF kind of pulls back the limiter on muscle growth. IGF-1 also stimulates satellite cells to proliferate and differentiate and satellite cells are stem cells in the muscle tissue and they add nuclei to the muscle fibers and more nuclei means more potential for muscle protein synthesis since the nuclei are what gives the instructions to the ribosomes to make muscle proteins. IGF-1 reduces muscle protein breakdown by inhibiting the pathway called the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. You don't need to know what that means but basically you experience less muscle loss during intense training or caloric deficits if you've got plenty of IGF-1. IGF-1 is great for muscle growth and that's part of why it's banned from competition because taking it would give you an unfair advantage. In this video we're interested in natural optimization of IGF-1. IGF-1 also grows bones by promoting chondrocyte proliferation and bone elongation in the growth plates. So it is crucial to the growth spurts that you get during puberty. Very important for getting taller and general growth of your skeleton and in adults it supports bone remodeling and bone density. IGF-1 also enhances insulin sensitivity and increases fat metabolism so more glucose gets sucked up into the muscles because that's what insulin does and the body switches more towards burning fat for energy instead of carbs but it is important to note that although IGF-1 promotes fat metabolism it's mostly growth hormone that does that which you'd know if you saw my growth hormone video. And beyond the improvements in physicality and fat metabolism, IGF-1 has a bunch of other benefits like improving the thymus function, thymus is an immune organ in your chest that makes the white blood cells used to fight infections. It improves skin health and appearance like less wrinkles and IGF-1 seems to protect the mitochondria. So we know what IGF-1 does now. Now it's the interesting part of this video which is how do we optimize our IGF-1 levels to get these benefits. If you're enjoying this video I have a weekly newsletter where I talk about health and fitness topics like this. Sign up in the description for free and you'll also get a free workout program with that. IGF-1 is influenced by lots of factors. Insulin enhances growth hormone receptor sensitivity in the liver and it increases the amount of free circulating IGF-1 by reducing the amount of IGF binding protein. 
So I'm not recommending maxing out your insulin all the time, obviously. Best time to do it is after a workout so that the carbs and amino acids that you eat get taken up into the muscles. Insulin and IGF-1 are both very anabolic. And in fact, some bodybuilders inject insulin to promote muscle growth. Again, I am not suggesting you do this. Resistance training is something that boosts growth hormone and IGF-1. Watch the growth hormone video for more details. But basically, it is high intensity, high volume, fatiguing training. Things like five sets of six to ten reps of squats with a quite a heavy weight, for example. And resistance training is one of the best, most powerful ways to boost your IGF-1. Deep sleep is also extremely important for growth hormone and IGF-1. Growth hormone is released during the early phases of sleep where there's more deep sleep. To get the best deep sleep quality, make sure you're keeping a regular sleeping schedule, ideally aligned with the circadian rhythm. So if you're going to bed at 3 a.m. and waking up at 1 p.m., you're probably going to have problems. Circadian disruption is very real and it's bad. Watch the sunrise and sunset every day and spend some time outside every day. Eat your meals at pretty much the same times each day and not too close to bedtime because that can mess with your sleep. Block bright and blue lights after sunset. These lights tell your brain that it's still time to be awake so it suppresses melatonin production. You want darkness after sunset and getting ready for sleep. Before bed, chill out. Uh, don't be scrolling rage bait on social media and stuff that's going to stress you out or just make you like active. You need to kind of de-stimulate and relax before bed. However, that works for you, like a warm bath, reading a book, anything like that. And keep your bedroom cool, dark and silent. High cortisol inhibits growth hormone and IGF-1 production and that reduces anabolic signals. So you need to keep stress fairly low if possible. Do some things to manage your stress like meditation, breath work, relaxation. Those have all been shown in the studies to work pretty well for lowering stress and cortisol. I mentioned thyroid earlier. So you need to take care of your thyroid health. That is a big topic, but some basics are having a nutrient dense diet, especially iodine and selenium and you can get those from eggs, milk and fish. You need to sleep well, which I've just discussed. Low stress, don't overtrain in the gym, maintain good gut health and avoid endocrine disruptors. I have a full video on that, which I'll link in the description. Take care of your liver health as well. That basically involves reducing your exposure to toxins, alcohols, endocrine disruptors, xenoestrogens, having a nutrient dense diet and potentially some liver supportive tools like milk thistle. Obviously it's best to kind of test to see whether you have problems with your liver, your thyroid, all of these things. And then you can build a targeted protocol to address the problems that you have. These are, I'm just giving like quite generic advice for protecting the health of these organs. Now my favorite part, some food and supplements that increase IGF-1. Amino acids like arginine and leucine are well known to boost growth hormone secretion and that will boost IGF-1 in turn. So make sure you're getting a variety of amino acids in your diet from things like eggs, meat on the bone, which will give you a bit more collagen and the amino acids that make up that. Fish, dairy, whey, bone broth is another great one. People who eat a lot of protein as children and higher quality protein like animal protein, they often end up being taller. And in fact, protein intake is one of the strongest correlates with height after genetics. And one of the reasons for that is protein's effect on IGF-1. You also don't want to be in a chronic caloric deficit or do a lot of long-term fasting because that can lower IGF-1. If you're going to do caloric deficit and fasting, use them strategically, don't overdo it. Some other foods are milk and eggs. Those are especially powerful. Zinc is an important mineral for IGF-1. I recommend getting it from food like beef and occasional oysters. I try to have oysters like once a week. You don't need an excessive amount of zinc. Another mineral is magnesium. This is one that I do recommend supplementing because it can be hard to get from the diet. And this is probably the one supplement I would recommend to most people. Creatine and branched chain amino acids or BCAAs both improve your training output and your recovery and so they can indirectly influence IGF production by basically optimizing the anabolic environment. Vitamin D is another important nutrient and ideally you get that from midday sunlight but if it's the winter or you just don't have enough UVB sunlight to make enough vitamin D then you get it from fatty fish or vitamin D supplements. And some other foods include blueberries, vitamin C and ecdysterone which is a steroid hormone found in some insects and plants and you can get it from quinoa and spinach. So rewind the video, take 
take some notes on this section and make sure you're doing all of these things if you want to maximize your IGF-1 for growth. But the most important ones are going to be lifting, deep sleep, and getting lots of protein, especially animal protein. There are some risks to having super high levels of IGF-1 for a long time, but that generally doesn't happen unless you have a genetic condition, you have hyperthyroidism, you're chronically overfed and really stuffing yourself for years or decades, especially with lots of animal protein. This is probably the biggest risk for most guys. Or you're taking exogenous IGF-1 or analogs. The body tightly regulates its IGF-1 production. If it gets too high, production will be decreased to bring it back down. The risks of excessive IGF-1 are mostly low blood sugar, acne, organ growth, and increased risk of some cancers, which is obviously the one that people are most concerned about. But on the other hand, low IGF-1 IGF-1 levels are linked to frailty, poor recovery, and increased mortality. So there's an ideal middle ground that we're aiming for with natural optimization. Let's just summarize the most important things for increasing your IGF-1. Deep sleep, resistance training, plenty of protein and amino acids, low stress. Try to time your biggest insulin spike for after your workout with carbs and protein. The best foods for IGF-1 generally are milk, eggs, meat and fish. Take creatine, get vitamin D and make sure you get enough zinc and magnesium. Those are kind of the essentials. Thank you for watching. Sign up to my free email newsletter for more like this. And like I said, you'll also get a free workout program when you sign up. Let me know in the comments if you have any more tips for increasing IGF-1 and I'll see you in the next video.